Welcome back, everybody, to the Uncensored CMO. Now, I don't know if you know this, but guest number one on the podcast was a certain Richard Schotten who had just launched his book, The Choice Factory, which went on to become one of the best marketing textbooks of recent years. Um, Richard has gone on to uh, become a real legend in terms of behavioral science, and he's back. He's back with a new book, uh, The Illusion of Choice, which is out imminently. And I got an advanced copy and the opportunity to catch up with Richard again and ask him a few questions about his new book. And most importantly, how can we apply behavioral science biases to our marketing to become more effective marketers? Richard doesn't disappoint. As usual, he is full of anecdotes, stories, research, experimentation, but all of it very applicable to what we do in marketing. So without further ado, let's get into it. Here I am talking to Richard Chotton. So Richard, welcome to the show. Very good to see you again. So it's been three years since we last chatted. I think uh, last time we caught up, you were BBH's World Cup. Oh, yes, yeah, yeah, And you just, just yeah, read yeah. that and uh, Choice Factory was storming it in the charts and that sort of thing. So how's it gone and uh, what's happened in the last three years since we last spoke? Uh, very well. So after I wrote The Choice Factory, I set up on my own. So I now run a consultancy called Astro 10, where we work with companies like Mondelez and Sky and Brewdog to apply behavioural science to marketing. And the other big thing I've done recently is I've written... Uh, another book about applying behavioural science to marketing called The Illusion of Choice. Brilliant. We're going to come on to that. Yeah. We're going to come on to it. Before we do, I thought I'd uh, fire some questions. Well, actually, firstly, just to say thank you, because uh, I've tried to apply some of your techniques to the uncensored CMO. Yeah. So I try this out on you. So the first thing is, which might amuse you, um, one of the points you said to me last time is don't go for a perfect five-star review, yeah. right? And, and I, I took that to heart. And actually someone, um, uh, I did someone a favour and, and she said to me, oh, can I do anything in return? I said, could you leave me a review, but maybe not a five-star review? Yeah. And bless her, she rave review and gave me four stars. So my average now is 4.9. I have to say, I, I slightly got buyer's remorse. I was like, yeah, all the other podcasts have got five-star and I've got 4.9. So I'm hoping this is actually going to work. Yeah, so there, I mean, it is... That was based on a study. There's a, a study by, I think it was Northwestern University, where they look at 100,000 plus product reviews. So things like shampoo, hair care. And then they look at those um, brands and see the likelihood of the brand being purchased. And what they find is that as the brand, the score goes up, so every review was from like one to five. As the score goes up, people become more likely to buy to begin yeah. with. But then there is some point, and it varies by category, but between 4.2 and 4.5 when purchasing peaks. And then if the score gets higher, propensity to buy drops. Now, their argument was perfection is too good to be true. And if people see a five-star review for all of a shampoo or hair care yeah. or deodorants, uh, reviews, people assume that it's more likely that brand has manipulated the numbers rather than it actually being perfect. So I think there's, there's definitely evidence that perfection can be, people can be sceptical towards it. Whether or not that 4.2 to 4.5 would hold for podcasts is a different thing. Because if the norm... It's probably is higher, every, isn't it? Well, the norm everyone, is very yeah, high. So yes, you probably, I yeah, think 4.9, yeah. 4.95 maybe might be where yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I have to, I have to yeah. see. I have to do a correlation and see what yeah. the link, linkage is. Um, the second thing I took last time is the mean tweet as well. So um, I've mostly had fantastic feedback on the podcast. I have yeah. to say, it, it's genuinely something that kind of, you know, makes it all worthwhile. But I had this one, um, this one person actually, and she's a big fan of the show as well, which is quite funny. She goes, uh, I can't remember which episode it was, but oh, you know, some grizzled old Adland guy moaning about how it used to be or something like this. It was, it was something like that. And it, it, it genuinely made me laugh actually. Yeah. So when I do my creds, I always include that at the bottom. So I, I have my, here are my five-star reviews and, and I, I sneak that one-star one review at the bottom because it. I think it shows people's level of authenticity and honesty that I'm quite happy to show you the negative review as well as all the good ones. But, you know, so how, how mean tweets kind of... So, so the, the, I mean, there are a few examples of that working well. My, my favourite is probably Stuart Lee. So he's uh, a comedian, very left-wing in his, his approach. Whenever he runs a campaign to promote his upcoming tour he will always include very positive reviews from the guardian or the independent but alongside that he will put a very negative review from either the telegraph or the daily mail so one of his shows the review from jan moore was a slime pit of bitterness uh, so she's a columnist in the daily mail and i think what he's recognized is for his audience they are as much motivated by knowing the guardian and think he's brilliant as doing the opposite of whatever the, the Daily Mail think. So I think saying who you're not for yes. 
is a powerful, incredible signal because people recognise it comes at a cost. Yeah. They recognise that Stuart Lee has to be genuinely left-wing to be completely open about alienating such a large swathe of his audience. So I think there's some, yeah, there's some nice examples of that happening. So the third and final uh, thing I adopted as well was, was uh, maybe I need to call this pre-social proof, okay, but uh, okay, okay. When, when I launched the podcast, I, I made this outrageous claim, actually yeah. inspired by Paul Arden, um, that I had the world's number one podcast by John Evans. Of course, the only podcast by John Evans, but you know, the headline got me out there as the world's number one. And of course, I've been trying to catch up with my own claim since then sort of thing. But yeah. so, you know, but it's funny actually how, how many people go, oh, congratulations on reaching that achievement, yeah. you know, not realising the joke. But uh, it, it, I think it worked on me because uh, I remember being in the airport and I saw Paul Arden's book, It's Not How Good You Are, It's How Good You Want to Be. Yeah. And I saw that the world's best selling book. And I'm like, Really? How come I don't know about this best-selling yeah. book? And then I saw by Paul Arden, I thought, ah, I see what he did there. So, and it is actually an amazingly, amazingly good book. But that was that was the sort of the... I, I think there's two two interesting things. I think there's one. Sometimes where the academic behavioral scientists fall down is they apply these experiments and insights in a very literal manner. So, you know, you, you have a message from the government saying nine out of ten people pay their tax on time. That harnesses social proof. It harnesses the idea that most people do this and therefore others are more likely to do so. But it's hardly using any, any, any creative flair. I think where these biases become really powerful and effective is where you just see the experiment as an interesting hypothesis about human nature, but you don't see it as the end place. You think, well, how do I take that insight uh, and apply it a bit more creatively? So my favourite social proof example at the moment is from Red Bull. So when they launched, they were a small brand. They couldn't honestly claim market leadership, but they created the impression of market leadership. What they did was they would find uh, nightclubs. Uh, as people were leaving, they had gone there half an hour before, half an hour before the club closed, and they'd filled up the bins around it with crushed, empty Red Bull cans. So anyone coming out thought, oh, all those people in there dancing furiously, yeah. they were powered by Red Bull. This thing, this must be something that lots of people are using. So that to me is a lateral creative use of social proof. Innocent had a similar thing, didn't they, at festivals where they'd have a, should, should we give up our, our jobs and start a business and like throw throw the bottle in the bin, you agree. And oh, okay. the bottle that said, yeah, give yeah. you, you know, you should start yeah. a business was the one that was full. So everyone was going, oh, that must be good because everyone thinks, you know, yeah. it's good enough that I'd start my own business, yeah. um, which is brilliant. Um, so, well, uh, one, of the, one of the things, by the way, your new, thank you for sending me an advanced copy of your new book. One of the things I loved about it is not only this, the way you tell the story makes it very easy to understand, you know, uh, the biases, but in every single chapter, you make an application for how you might use it, which I think is what makes it so great, a, a tool for marketers. Um, so tell me what biases you employed yourself in your book, because oh, okay, yeah, I did yeah. enjoy some of them as I went through. I did, I did. Smile. I haven't seen the pratfall effect yet, but okay, I did. I did okay. notice a few others you'd. Uh, well, let's deployed. claim that any typos are a purposeful <laughs> yes uh, <laughs> addition. Um, so the first one was the, the subtitle. So it's the illusion of choice. Sixteen and a half behavioural biases that influence what you buy. Uh, the sixteen and a half bit is purposefully done. So partly there was. I always loved that um, that book, history of history of the world in 10 and a half chapters. So I think that had stuck in my mind. And then I read a study by uh, Schindler at Rutgers University. And he argues that we are more likely to trust and believe precise numbers. So his study, very simple, shows a group of people an ad for a deodorant. And there are lots of claims about this deodorant. The main one being for half the people, it reduces perspiration by 50%. The other half of the people who read the ad, it says, reduces perspiration by 47% or 53%. He then questions them all as to how accurate they think the claim is, how believable and trustworthy they think the claim is. And what he sees is the group that saw the precise claim think it's more accurate, yeah. thinks more believable, thinks more trustworthy. His argument is what people learn gradually over life is if someone talks in generalities, they generally don't know what they're talking about. If people talk precisely, they're talking from much firmer based knowledge. Now, if you think about your own personal experience, if someone said to you, how old's your cousin? You'd say, oh, they're in their 40s or they're in their 50s. If someone said, how old's your brother or your sister? You'd say, oh, they're 37, they're 39. You would answer very specifically. Yeah. So over time, people learn that 
specificness implies knowledge and certainty. Vagueness implies uncertainty. So I thought I could take that principle and add it to the, <laughs> well uh, the, 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 the subtitle. So, well, so, it, did, it did stand out. Yeah. Well, and I was yeah, like, yeah. what's half a chapter? You know, what's half a bias? Is it a, is it a shorter bias or is it not a complete well, bias? Sorry, yeah, should, it's sorry. intriguing, isn't it? Like, I should, what is I half should a bias, stress you know? the half chapter is a chapter about precision. Yeah. So there's a, there's a half chapter about precision. There are actually 17 and a half chapters because there is oh, a, a free a bonus better. chapter about why bonuses tend to work better than the money off. Um, so I have tried to apply the biases within the book. Um, and then the, the other area I suppose I've tried to apply it is in the, um, in the marketing. Yes. So I'm not sure if we can do this yet, but the date that the book comes out is the 28th of March and the copies have just been printed and they're at the warehouse. So they should be arriving like to the distributor in the next week. So I was thinking of applying this principle of scarcity, the idea that yes. we want what's in short supply. Yeah. So I'm thinking of saying, oh, well, you know, if you want to buy in bulk from me or from the publisher, if you want to buy 10 or more, you can get them yeah. a couple of weeks before the, the launch date. Well, the other one I noticed, actually, uh, th 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 there's a point in the book where you say, feel free to ignore the following section, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. which I thought was genius yeah. as well, because telling someone they can ignore something is a surefire way to get them to go, well, hang on a minute. If, you know, like, what am I going to miss out on if I'm being told I can ignore it? Yeah, so a, that yeah, was quite clever. There's a lovely, yeah, there's a lovely bias called the but you are free principle. So a French psychologist back in 2000 called, well, actually, I, I always, I'm not quite sure about the pronunciation, so apologies if anyone's listening to French, but I think it's Gagen. Uh, and what he does is go and approach people at bus stops and ask them for, for spare change. And sometimes he says, can I have some spare change to get the bus? And 10% of people agree. Other times he says, can I have some spare change to get the bus, but you're free to accept or refuse. And in that scenario, you get 48% of people uh, agreeing to hand over money. So there's this huge swing in compliance. His argument is one of the big drives of human behaviour is a, is, a, is a desire to have a sense of control, a desire to have a sense of agency. If people feel like they're restricted, they push back against that. Emphasising their freedom uh, makes them feel much more comfortable to agree because they don't feel... And that's an astonishing anyway. difference, isn't it? You're talking almost five times. Yeah. And now, I, 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 I think, yes. Yeah. And, and actually, that is, a, that is a massive difference. Uh, that is a slightly bizarre circumstance. I mean, yeah. marketers are probably thinking, well, we're not beggars. Okay. It's very different. So, it ha but it has been replicated and rerun. So, where these biases become really powerful is when you have an, a meta analysis. So, a independent psychologist goes out, looks at all the studies like let's say there's 20 or 50 or 70 around the but you're free principle and they look for commonalities and consistencies. And there have been studies done, meta-analyses done on but you are free principle. So it is a principle that holds, but that five-fold variation is at the extreme end. So people shouldn't necessarily yeah. expect it. Yeah, I was going to say, it's quite transformational, isn't it? Yeah. Um, now, before we get into the book, so I, I want to ask you, um, in fact, what I did with the book is I actually went through it myself and scored oh, it yeah, based yeah, on yeah, yeah. how big an impact and how easy is it to yeah, do. And, yeah. and then we'll come, we'll come to the ranking I ended up in okay. in a minute, and uh, I'd love to get your thoughts on it. Um, I've got a few listener questions as well. So I thought I'd uh, get these out first so that uh, make sure we, we've kind of given them uh, uh, a fair hearing. Um, the first one comes from Ian, who said, is the illusion that you talk about greater for the consumer or is it greater for the marketer? So that's quite interesting because there's probably a bias we have as marketers as much as there is a bias that the consumer faces. Oh, I, I, absolutely. So psychology, behavioural science is the study of how people behave rather than how they claim to behave. It is the study of human nature. It is not a study just about consumers. You know, the, the psychologists that do the original experiments are interested in, in, in people in general. How we behave at work, how we behave as consumers, how we behave as parents, we are definitely prone to these biases and insights in all those different circumstances. What I think's interesting, and probably what I should say is that's not speculation. So we talked earlier about social proof. Very well-known idea that if we think something's popular, it will become more popular still. Marketers apply it all the time. There have been studies done by the Behavioural Insights team and the Australian government, which have shown that bias of social proof uh, affects doctors. So I think it was 2019 the Australian government did it. They sent out 6,600 letters to GPs or whatever, Australians call GPs, 
all of these letters try to encourage those doctors to give out fewer prescriptions. So the excessive handing out of, of um, antibiotics is a massive problem. They were trying to encourage people to give out fewer antibiotics. Different variants of the letter. Some of them just said, you should not give out antibiotics because it has these big effects, big negative impacts. And when they did that, there was a reduction of 2 or 3% in prescription rates. Most successful letter they sent out had that same argument, but an extra line saying, you are giving out more antibiotics, Mr. or Mrs. GP, than 80% of your peers. So it compared that doctor's yeah. behaviour to the, to the norm. That was the most successful message. And I think it was the order of 12 or 13% yeah. reduction in prescription rates. So a huge change based on emphasising what other relevant people yeah. are doing. Now, those doctors, you know, like marketers, like uh, many professionals, they cling very uh, much to the idea that they are logical, rational decision makers. But the evidence is completely opposite. The same biases affect ah, consumers, affect I love this. We're going to come back to this in a minute because I think ah. marketers overestimate their ability to judge their own their own work and, and have over let's come back to it. Yeah, so okay. I think this is a really fascinating one. Now Fernanda asked this question, we very topical question this. Can AI correctly predict human biases? So I just wonder, does does the machine replicate the bias or can the machine be trained to understand yeah. the bias and account for it? I don't know. I mean okay. frankly my knowledge of AI could probably be written on a post stamp. So people <laughs> should uh, treat this section with, 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 with yeah with, with, with caution. However there is a broad principle of rubbish in, rubbish out. So there is a famous, uh, I would call it a parable. It's like an apocryphal story. I don't think it ever happened, but I think it, it makes the point. And it's called the Russian tank problem. Yeah. So data scientists and, uh, have talked about this since the 1980s. And they talked about an example of the um, defence, what would it be, the Ministry of Defence over there, trying to train um, computers to identify Russian tanks or American tanks. So they get their secret surveillance photos of the Russian tanks, feed them into the computer. They get their official photos of their American tanks and feed them into the computer. Unfortunately, what the algorithm learned to do was differentiate between not Russian tanks and American tanks, but between grainy crap quality photos and very high quality photos. The point being, the bias essentially in how they had collected that data was, as you say, replicated by the algorithm. It had tr trained on a unrepresented data set yeah. and it yeah. spewed out. And when you see all to. those chat GPT kind of examples that people are throwing out, you see that time and time again, don't you? It sort of it replicates the misinformation or the bias that is already out there on the internet as opposed to yeah. getting to what is So real. if that's the data set, it's using yeah. my speculation, and I should say this is not my expertise, complete speculation would be it will just replicate that. Yeah. However, to me, the interesting bit is not whether it's going to be accurate or not, but whether we can use it to make ourselves more accurate. Yes. So I'm really into chess. And in chess, there's been this lovely progression of thinking. So you have pre-1990s, humans can thrash computers. So humans are kind of uh, the, 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 the best. You then have 1997, uh, Deep Blue, or wherever it was, beats Kasparov. So people then think, oh, okay, it's super, super computers that are best. Now the thinking is it's about set what they call essentials. So a reasonable chess player and a reasonable computer program can be either a grandmaster oh, really? or a supercomputer. It's, it's the combination yeah. of the two things. Yeah. Now that to me is where chat GPT or whatever it's called yeah. is interesting. Not as we shouldn't expect it to give us the right answer. But if we take some of its suggestions and then add the human yeah, yeah, interpretation, yeah. then makes I think it makes sense because actually more we had a, a post on LinkedIn about the Nike Tiffany collaboration, which oh, yeah, everyone yeah, was like, yeah, oh, yeah, that's yeah, a bit yeah, lame. Yeah. And the um, AI generated design did much better. But actually, even when you look at that design, you go, well, actually, I'd make some tweaks yeah. to it. I'd, I'd make it more personal. I'd make it more authentic looking. It's a bit crude, but it sort of does the basics very well. It doesn't take it to the level of exclusivity and desirability that maybe you'd want. But I think perfect example there that a designer with the intel that crowdsources what people think of it. Yeah. I mean, so so amazing, yeah, you, yeah. Could you could have it creating 10 different versions and you as the, the human pick which one's yeah. best or... You pick one or two and start combining yeah, elements yeah, and build on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. So it's inspiration. Use it as inspiration and yeah. think of it as an input into 
the marketing process, then I think yeah. it's exciting. Now, award for Jedi Master level question for you okay. comes from our friend Kev yeah, Chesters yeah, 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 yeah. here, which I have to say, he's slightly lost me on it. He, <laughs> yeah. he was referring okay. to Van Rostov and Riscola League <laughs> yeah. Wagner studies and this kind of thing. But look, I think, and, and Kev, apologies yeah, if I yeah, if yeah. don't do you know, credit to your question, but I think he's saying, look, you know, if you look at different behavioral uh, biases, there's arguments about the start being most important in, in, in something or the middle or the peak end. We'll come on to talk about peak end in a minute or how recently you, you, know, you heard something. Um, it feels like start, middle, end is everything. So, you know, explain uh, how those biases work or what's most important. I mean, is it true to say that there are, you know, there are biases that influence all parts of, a, you know, an ad, you know? Yeah, I think he's talking there about there's, there's a couple of different biases around memory. So you've got this idea of primacy. The first thing that we encounter yeah. is, is particularly memorable. Recency, same for the last. And then the peak end rule which is from Kahneman and Radelmeyer, which is in an experience, the thing that we remember most is the peak, most intense moment and the final moment. Now, I don't think there's necessarily a contradiction there. If you go back to the original studies about uh, recency and primacy, uh, they were by people like Bennett Murdoch back in the 60s. What he did was give people these long lists of information. So sometimes there might be, let's say, five animals or 20 animals or 40 animals he then read those out and asked people later on to recall what they could. And pretty much every variant of length, he saw the same pattern in terms of what was remembered. People did reasonably well at remembering the first few words. You then see this decline. So the middle words, very few people remember. And then towards the end, you see this huge spike in memory. So we're very, very good at remembering the final things. So... This became known as the serial position effect. We tend to remember first things quite well in a list, and then much better we remember the final things. You then have the peak end rule, which is slightly different in that it wasn't about memorizing lists of information. It was about experiences. And what Kahneman found was it was the final moment of an experience that was most memorable and what he called the peak. So that's not the middle moment. It is the most intense moment. Right. So... So if, that could come at any point in the, yeah, yeah, in the ad if yeah, you're talking about yeah, advertising. Yeah, 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 example, yeah, exactly. So you have an hour-long podcast. People will remember that final yeah. closing two or three minutes yeah. if you ask them a, a, you know, a week later. And they'll remember the one thing that yeah. you know, was particularly funny it's or particularly advice, insightful. Yeah. 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 So I don't, I don't think those are necessarily in contradiction. You know, both of them land on, well, if you had to do the beginning or the end, yeah. the end's more important. And then Kahneman's point about the peak, that is um, agnostic about where it is in the, yeah. in, in, in the situation. Interesting question here from Lulana, actually, and this has come up before. What are your feelings on the ethics of using behavioural science? You know, at what point does that become manipulation or control? Um, I mean, I know there's, you know, famous kind of nudge units, you know, all designed to try and persuade voters to vote in a certain way. Do you have a point of view on the ethics of this? When does it... You know? I'm not sure if any nudge unit has uh, tried to persuade voters to vote in a particular way, <laughs> yeah, unless they're doing some kind of black ops I don't know about. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it's a, it's a fascinating one because to me, the question isn't about behavioural science, it's about marketing. I mean, yeah. marketing, we are trying to influence people to purchase our, our products. Now, behavioural science is just a set of insights into human nature. These insights are not creations of behavioural scientists. It is just a reflection of how people behave. So I think Rory Sutherland, uh, I think it was him who came up with this phrase, is like, behavioural science is like gravity. It, it's there. You can choose to ignore it and work against human nature, or you can harness it. So f from my perspective, the behavioural science part is just a neutral tool it can be used for good or bad. So in the same way, you know, rhetoric is a neutral tool. You can use it to inspire people to love each other. You can use it to inspire people to hate each other. It's just a set of rules about what makes um, an argument persuasive. Beha behavioural science is exactly the same. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't be focusing on the behavioural science part. I'd be focusing on what you are trying how to you, use. How it. you deploy yeah. it is the key thing. If you are using it, to create a negative experience for a customer, to get them to do something that they are going to regret, that should be 
setting off uh, alarm bells. Yeah. Makes complete sense. Yeah. No, I really like it. Um, another interesting question here as well. Um, obviously, you know, we're all fans of Byron and mental availability and physical availability. Burnett and Field have done some amazing work yeah. in, 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 you know, in terms of, you know, long and short and so on. How does behavioural science contribute to that, that kind of the, the, the laws, I suppose yeah. you might call them? Uh, are they, is it complementary? Is there any conflicts in terms? It feels like, well, I guess from my point of view, it feels like one demonstrates the empirical evidence for what happens to grand, brands as they grow. What behavioral science gives you is almost the tools that you might need to unlock that growth yeah. is kind of maybe how I'd sort of yeah. attempt to answer that. But what's your point of view? So my point of view, firstly, I've always had a bit of an issue with the word law, which I think kind of removes human free will. And I would argue that all of these uh, sources of knowledge are about probabilities and propensities. I, I think if we talk about laws, we begin to think of um, the general public as being, you know, puppets that we can manipulate at will, and that doesn't seem to bear um, any kind of observation. You know, it's very hard to change people's behaviour. The, the, these ideas just give us, you know, the best possible chance. But that aside, I think there's an awful lot of overlap between the, the different. Uh, data sets. So Les Binet often talks about, you know, one of the main findings from his analysis and Peter Field's analysis of the IPA data bank is that campaigns that aim to create an emotional reaction yeah. tend to trump those that aim for a, yeah. uh, a, a, a rational reaction. Binet has gone out and said, well, when he uses this word emotion, he is using it as a shorthand for system one thinking, yeah. you know, which is a yeah. behavioral science principle. Uh, he it's It's about people making fast, intuitive, quick decisions. Now, this isn't about ads that make people cry. It's about these associations that people pick up on almost immediately. So that, to me, is a reflection of well-known ideas in behavioural science. What Binet, Binet and Field have done so brilliantly is show that it works in the world of brands. But where I think behavioural science has massive value is Binet and Field's work says this is what you should aim for, creating an emotional reaction. What it doesn't do is tell you how to create that emotional reaction. Yes. Behavioral science is a collection of thousands of experiments, all of which tell you very practically, yeah. very specifically, how to create that emotional reaction. Yeah. So you, you touched on the pratfall effect earlier. That is the idea from Elliot Aronson, that if you admit a flaw, yeah. you become more appealing. Yeah. So the pratfall effect is a way you as a marketer facing a challenge or a brief today can actually apply this insight and create emotional Love it. Factors. And let's get into the book as well yeah. now because it'd be a good time to do that because um, actually what I loved, as I said before, what I loved about it was how you go from the science and the studies into the practical application. And that's what I'm really keen to get to. Um, so, for example, when I was reading the book, I, I challenged myself to score each chapter, yeah. right, on the basis of how big an impact could this give us, right, as marketers. Yeah. Now, I'm thinking about myself a little bit, so it will change depending on what industry you're in, I'm sure, and how easy is it to unlock it. And so I, I thought, I'm going to try and rank your behavioural yeah. biases, but now it's because personal to me, but, you know, I'll rank them based on impact and ease, and we'll, yeah. we'll see how we get on. So I've kind of come up with the eight or nine that I thought stood out to me. Um, but before I do... I noticed you're wearing a T-shirt today. And there's a very interesting observation as well in the book about, uh, you know, what we wear, you know, oh, the, yeah, the, you yeah, know, the yeah. suit versus T-shirt. Maybe it's the Zuckerberg effect or the Zuckerberg yeah. bias, isn't it? But there's something interesting about status and, and, and how you dress. So, yeah, there is this um, wonderful uh, Harvard psychologist, Harvard Business School, I think, uh, called Francesca Gino. And, and she came up with an idea called the red sneakers effect. So inspired by Zuckerberg turning up at an IPO or some big meeting in a hoodie and red sneakers, red trainers. So her idea is if you break a convention, you signal status and become more appealing. So her ori original work, early 2000s, she goes to academic conferences where there is a strong social norm to dress smartly. Yeah. So people turning up, if you're a bloke, it'd be shirt, maybe a tie, yeah. jacket. So that's the social norm. That's the expectation. People turn up at these conferences. She is waiting there with a clipboard. And as they are coming in, she surreptitiously notes down on this continuum from scruffy to smart yeah. people's dress style. She then later on goes and finds those individuals. And she says to them, how many citations have you got? Yeah. 
So one citation is your work being referenced once in a peer review journal. So essentially, the more citations you have, the more successful you are as an academic. It's a slightly crude metric, but it's a decent metric. What she finds is there is an inverse correlation between number of citations and smartness of dress. So the super successful, you know, the rock star academics who get paid hundreds of thousands of pounds to go and do conference talks, they are the ones that are dressed scruffily. They're breaking the convention. It's the junior academics, the people who haven't got tenure, they're just starting out in their career, they've hardly got any citations. They are the ones that are dressing smartly and abiding by convention. Gino's argument is that it takes a degree of status to be able to afford to break I was going to say that because yeah. it, it, because it, what if the junior academic were to turn up scruffy? Does does it flip on its head and they get they, they lose points, as it will, perception? Because it's like, well, hang on a minute. You know, you're, yeah. so, you're not in that league to be yes. able to, you know, so they, 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 it's two things. So, so, it, Yeah, so yeah. she firstly says they can't do it because, yeah, take, take a work example. Yeah. CEO turns up wearing flip-flops and Bermuda shorts to the board meeting. No one's going to say anything. Yeah, yeah. If the intern turns up to the office exactly. wearing that, yeah, they get yeah, sent yeah, home. Yeah. And, and, and Gino's argument is people learn that over time. They associate convention breaking and high status. So what she argues and shows in later experiments is people are remarkably well attuned to this. So we see someone breaking convention yeah. and therefore we assume their higher status. Yes. So it is a slightly nuanced bias. If you are neutrally perceived or already admired, breaking that convention makes you more so. But you're absolutely right. She did run later experiments which showed if you have a poor perception, if you are seen as a bit of a, a joke, and then you also that, break convention, yeah. it can backfire. So you can't wear a T-shirt to you know, try and change your perception of, of being more well-tenured. You have to get this status first, then you can get away with it. Yes, or if people had no other information about you yeah. if it was neutral they've okay. never seen you before yeah, yeah, yeah. so it, it, it's very much if you give off other signals yeah. that suggest you have low status yeah. that's when it goes wrong it would be the combination ah, of the few um so but i would argue for, for, for advertising meeting up in a t-shirt is not harnessing the red sneakers effect well it's not everyone is it does. because no. everyone does i if know i turned up yes. in a bow tie context and, is king. Yeah. Uh, suit, <laughs> you know, know uh, a smoking a pipe yeah, yeah that, <laughs> I, I, I think that work, would be breaking at the convention <laughs> that would yeah. actually good point context is key yeah. in that one okay let's get into it right so bad news for fluffy marketers that came in at number one this is the okay. this is the concrete Ooh, phrase. Yeah, yeah. I thought this was interesting. And you did an experiment. Did, you ran the experiment yourself, didn't you? Yeah, Mike yeah. Trahan at uh, Leah yeah. Burnett. Um, the way we say things and the way we phrase things can have quite a big impact, can't it? Absolutely. So th th this was an interesting one. This isn't our complete insight. Uh, so it's not our insight. It, it, it's, there's a study back from 1972 by a Canadian psychologist called Begg. And what he does very briefly, he gave 25 students a list of 22 word phrases. Uh, they're all jumbled up, but some of them are what he called concrete phrases, like white horse or square door. Some of them are what he called abstract phrases, like subtle fault or basic truth. He then asked people to recall those words later on. And he found that on average, people remembered 9% of the abstract words, 36% of the concrete words. So there's this huge fourfold swing in memorability. His argument is the, that vision is the most powerful of our senses. Yeah. So with a concrete phrase, if I say square door to you, almost unbidden in your mind, pops yeah. up an image of a square door. Yeah. That makes it sticky. That makes it memorable. But if I said something like, um, what was it, a subtle fact, you know, forgetting. Uh, uh, well, you made the point, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly, <laughs> exactly. exactly. Uh, uh, I can't remember any of those non-concrete phrases. <laughs> there's nothing to picture. It's completely... But forgettable. I think a lot of advertising strap lines are the fluffy ones, aren't they? I, I mean, look, I don't have any data to back this up, but certainly oh. uh, you see a lot of those phrases that don't quite Trust, make sense. provenance, in, innovation, you know, yeah. all this stuff. You're yeah. absolutely right. It's absolutely fine as a brand. Of course, you're going to have an abstract objective. The argument from Begg is, well, you need to turn that abstract objective into concrete language. If you go out and talk about quality and provenance, completely forgettable. If you translate it in something that is visualizable, then it becomes very sticky. Something else, a, a really topical one, this as well. There's a little quote in this chapter where you, um, I think it was Stalin actually that said this, you know, yeah. if one man dies of hunger, it's a tragedy. If a million die, it's a statistic. And, you know, you're seeing that in Ukraine, you're seeing that in Turkey. I mean, you know, a story of a baby being 
you know, ex, you know, being saved in the, you know, in the in, in the rubble seven weeks after the earthquake will make headlines. The fact that it's now forty thousand, not thirty thousand, dead, you know, is almost overlooked, doesn't it? So. That, that, that's fascinating as well, isn't it? Yeah, and then there's, there's, there, are, there are specific studies, things by Paul Slovich at Oregon, where he shows what he calls the identifiable victim effect, yeah. that we are not set up to be able to comprehend and be moved by statistics. Mm-hmm. You're absolutely right. If you can turn those statistics into relatable stories, they tend to be much more powerful. Slovich is a lovely study. He, he, he kind of creates this fake experiment People think they've reached the end of it. They are paid for taking part. And then he says, oh, well, by the way, um, when we do these experiments, we always offer people the chance to donate some of the money to a charity. So if you want to, please do, but it's completely up to you. It'll be a secret. Half the people get a story about malnutrition in Mali, and it uses stats, hundreds of thousands suffering, thousands dying. The other half get a story about a single girl called Rokia suffering from malnutrition. And people are both more likely to donate and they're more likely to give a larger amount if they heard that yeah. that individual story. So you're absolutely right. You can take that broad principle of begs and apply it very much in in the. In the I've seen that world. coming through a lot of work actually I've done, which is better to tell one person's story really well than try and represent a group badly, sort of thing as well. You know, again coming through in lots of ad tests. Absolutely. absolutely. Which actually brings me on to the next. Oh, the only thing I should say because um, otherwise people might be thinking, wait a minute. And this, this is why Mike and I reran the study. Yeah. People might think, wait a minute, 25 students, 1972. What the hell can we learn from that? <laughs> that was our reaction as well. We thought it's an interesting hypothesis, yeah. but hardly perfectly proven. So we reran the study and it, it features yeah. in the book. Did it, I can't remember, 21, 22, whatever it was. National representative group, words that reflected commerce a bit more and put a bit of a gap between re- people reading the words and recalling them and not only did we find Begg's study held the results held in fact we found an even stronger it was a tenfold variation in 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 memory so it it, just to stress to people there often you will come across these psychology experiments where you think it's interesting but I don't like the way it's been studied or it's a very irrelevant category for me don't ignore them think well you know, we can rerun these. This should be these should this should be the fodder for our research projects. Finding studies out there that are quite good, but not proven in the brand world. Take them from the world of academia, rerun them, and then use some well, of these. Come insights. to ah, my number two. Okay, okay. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, perfectly, yeah, yeah. perfectly bridged there. Very well. Um, the importance of experimenting and testing. Right. So, uh, how accurately do you think experts can predict a Super Bowl winner? I am quite skeptical about experts and their view of the public, because there is an idea called the false consensus effect, which essentially argues we believe that our views and feelings and behaviours are much more common than they actually are. So what experts tend to do is be excited by uh, novelty or sophistication because they are immersed, or in our case, in the world of marketing. You see thousands upon thousands of ads, you think about them all the time. What you want to see is a groundbreaking technique that you can admire but the person who sees far fewer ads gives them far less interest they will be influenced by i think a very different yeah. set of metrics so and that's what we found with system one test so it was really interesting the, the drum ran ran an interview yeah. of of, of uh, experts yeah. adland experts oh it shouldn't say experts they are experts and not to not to uh, disparage their expertise um and by far and away the winner was an ad from tubi now the interesting thing about this ad was it was quite shocking it was uh, a bit dystopian it was a bit scary and uh and a bit shocking right and it definitely stood out you could see how it grabbed yeah. attention it came 52 on yeah. the system one chart i yeah. mean it was nowhere near yeah. a effective high scoring ad from a public point of view the one that won from a public point of view was disney Number two was M and M's when they brought the characters back. In fact, you know the, the, the yeah. one they had with Maya uh, Rudolph was like down at the bottom. The one with the M and M's characters, which was familiar and funny and, and whatever, came yeah. came at top. But I just was fascinated. There's almost a perfectly inverse correlation between what gets talked about by the experts. And you, you're absolutely right. What what appears in in you know in our study to show is that what got rewarded by the experts was novelty, shock value, story, you know, difference, you know, standing yeah. out and that sort of thing. The public didn't like it. Yeah. The public rejected it. There, I think there are a different set of motivations, especially if you are an agency, you are not rewarded for 
business impact necessarily. There's yeah. quite a poor correlation between how well the client's business does and what you get paid and your yeah. and how long you s- survive. Taleb talks about this uh, a lot. He argues what you're rewarded for as an agency or a consultant is sophistication and complexity. Now, if you give someone a very simple bit of advice, even if that advice is phenomenally effective, you're probably going to get fired because they're going to think, well, you know, I could have thought of that myself. So what ends up happening is people concoct phenomenally complicated strategies and, 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 and planning documents to sh- signal how intelligent they are to justify their fee rather than what should be the main aim, which is business effectiveness. And you've got a very clever example. I, I, I'll, I'll not ruin it for people who are going to read the book, because, uh, but you've got a very clever example from a charity as well, where, where you, you lay out some different responses to the, the, yeah. this charity does an annual event asking for, asking for donations. And, and I thought, oh, I work in marketing. I also work at System One. I know how behavioral yeah. science works. I read it and I thought, I bet I can do this. I, mean, I got it wrong. Wow. Well, I, 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 I mean, I think yeah. that the reason so, it's in there is if, gosh, if anyone gets that right, I'd be um, May. So I, I probably should mention it, it comes from uh, Ogilvy Change. Yeah. And what I love about Ogilvy Change is they do an annual report where they talk about campaigns that worked, campaigns yeah. that failed. And we can learn as much from yeah. those failures. And I think it is uh, a phenomenally positive thing that they do. So that, 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 that's the brilliant bit there. Um, yeah, it's the, 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 the study there that they published was for Christian Aid, I think eight different attempts to encourage people to give money the one that did best was using a thicker paper stock yeah so i, I, I totally, very hard i had that predict- almost at the bottom of my list i'm like really you know, yeah. it's like that seems a very might, minor executional yes. point i know? think but i think what it might have done is not change the probability of giving maybe but subtly influence people to you know feel they would be yeah. a bit cheap to give 10 pence yeah you know, this fancy paper. They've gone, they've they've gone yeah, to yeah, a lot yeah, of effort. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So Maybe anyone that's watching, it. listening, ignore the answers to the question when you oh, get yes, to the chapter. Yeah, 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 yeah. So oh, Richard, yeah. I was trying yeah, my yeah. best when answering yeah. the question so not got, to reveal I, the I answer. But anyway, away, scrap, scrap yeah. that one. You <laughs> yeah. didn't hear this. But we'll, anyway, we'll but, uh, but yeah, it was probably... But the point being, though, in the main chapter... It's a very clever point, yeah. It's hard to know what's going to work. And I think we can over-exaggerate the predictability. It's why I'm saying I don't like this language of laws. I think it's over the top that it's very hard to predict what's going to happen. So introducing an element of testing is absolutely key. And I talk in that chapter a lot about, well, how you can take principles in behavioural science to design your tests. Well, actually, I mean, talking about that, I think Ehrenberg Bass have done some testing. I think when I had Dr. Nicole Hartnott on the show, where uh, she asked marketers to predict which adverts were most successful, and they got 50% right. I mean, it was like, and she said there was a slight improvement when they were within category because maybe within your category you've just got a bit more of a bank of data to work from. But even then, it was only slight. That it, but marketers are very poor judges of their own work. So well, it does. It and, does. Yeah, and I, I, don't know, I don't think uh, it's just marketers. There's a famous study, a 20 year long study by Philip Tetlock, where he got professional forecasters to make predictions about what might happen. So it might be saying like, you know, do you think before 1985, Quebec will become independent? Do you think uh, apartheid will have finished before 1992? Yeah. You know, they are yes or no answers. So he can judge their success over a long period. And what he found was that professional forecasters were no better than average uh, in terms of being able to predict what happened. I think he, he used the language saying like, they're, they're worse than a dart throwing monkey. So it's not just marketers, it is a general... Um, problem with, yeah. I think, prediction and... and well, without it. getting too political then, mm. it might explain the SAGE charts uh, during the pandemic, which predicted the curve. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Almost, yeah. almost became a running joke, yeah. didn't it? Yeah. You know. <laughs> anyway, yeah. but uh, I'll try not to go there, but uh, it's quite funny in retrospect. So the third one I had, actually, we've already talked about this, so we'll, we'll briefly maybe go, go forward, was um, the power of freedom. That, you know, like we talked about earlier, I, I, I was... You know, blown away by the difference that just adding a a level of freedom yeah. to the question so that it's not set up as a you must it's set up as a feel free to you know accept or decline this so, I thought it was very yeah clever. so so we talked about the, the but you are free principle earlier there's a there's another study in that that chapter from a wonderful psychologist called ellen langer so she was i think she did this back in 1975 when she was at harvard and she goes around uh, an office block And she sells people lottery tickets. And the difference is that half the people are given their 
um, numbers, half will get to choose their numbers. Everyone pays a pound, but the difference is half pick, half are given the numbers. She then waits a week, and just before the draw is going to take place, she tries to buy those tickets back. And she finds that I think on average, the people who were given their numbers want $1.96 to sell them back. The people who pick their numbers want $8.67. So there is a fourfold increase in valuation. Now, her argument, which links with what we said earlier, is that one of the big drivers of behavior is this desire for control, this desire for agency. So even in this situation where the act of picking a number has no effect on what is a commodity, it doesn't change your odds at all, it means that people will value that item much more. So that idea, which became known as the illusion of control, you can apply that as a marketer. That's, brilliant. That's so powerful and really simple yeah. to do as well. well oh, so, so, so yeah. simple. So, so what most marketers do with a, with, with, with a promotion would be, yeah. okay, you buy 50 coffees and you get a £5 voucher on Amazon. What uh, Langer would say is, well, what you should do is say, you buy 50 coffees, you either get a £5 Amazon voucher or a £5 free car wash. Yeah. Even if 99.9% of people picked, or 100% of people picked the Amazon voucher, what she would argue is you should still keep still, the still give the freedom, yeah, yeah, because the act of picking will yeah. make them appreciate. Now, the other interesting example more. of this, taking it to the workplace, is that people that companies have experimented with unlimited holidays and giving the freedom take as many holidays as you want, yeah. be completely free. Isn't there some? Isn't there some statistic that actually they end up taking less holiday I, I, because I don't they know have the, the feeling of freedom? But specific data. But I think there, you, you've got a number of different biases at play. I would argue probably social proof and maybe the authority yeah. are two yeah. key things. If you look around and see that the authority figures, the people who are in control, who control your destiny to a degree, the board are not taking all their holiday, yeah. people will copy that yeah. in, uh, in order to progress better. And I think social proof, yeah. people will quickly try and work out what do most people do and then, but, and then I, but I bet when the employee's opinion survey goes around, oh, goes, then, oh yeah. we, we yeah, love working yeah, here yeah, because yeah, we have yeah. all this freedom yeah. to go and take my holiday. Yeah. So it's very clever. It's very, yeah. very clever. Um, the next one, actually, let's talk about, this is the one that surprised me the most because actually it's the one that I could see my own behavior kind of playing out. And this is toilet roll, pri- toilet roll pricing in a <laughs> pandemic, right? Yeah. So when the price of toilet roll went up in the pandemic, I kind of got a bit upset by that because it felt like, hang on a minute, the toilet roll companies are not really doing their fair. They're taking some profit here. They're not. They're not kind of doing their. They're not doing their part in society. But actually, there's some interesting, you know, behavioural science about our perception of fairness could even make us vote do something that's not in our interests because we'd rather that fairness is applied. Even you know, explain yeah. that because actually, I weirdly saw I, I, things in my own I, life. I, 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 yeah, I, I think that. this is a really interesting one. So. It's exactly what you said. It's this principle of people will cut off their nose to spite their face if they think that the offer they're being given is unfair. So there's a lovely 1996 study from uh, Blount and Basin. And what they do is, is among students, students are arriving at the campus, first day of term, they go up to half of them uh, and say, will you come to our lab tomorrow? We're psychologists and we're running an experiment. It'll take half an hour of your time. We'll pay you $7. And when they make that offer, 72% of people agree to take part. You know, back in 1996, $7 is quite a lot of money. Next group of people, they give them basically the same offer. Come to our lab tomorrow, half an hour work, but they say, we'll pay you $8. And then they add on, but we're really sorry. Earlier today, we were paying people $10, just run out of cash. That's only eight now. So essentially, you've got one group being paid $7, one group being paid offered eight. The group who were offered eight dollars with that proviso, only fifty-four percent agreed yeah. to take part. So you've got this decrease in willingness to take part in a role because people think they're being treated unfairly. Now, if you're an economist or you know completely logical, rational thinker, you'd say, "Well, it doesn't matter what other people have been paid. You should just weigh up: is half an hour of my time worth eight dollars?" Exactly. But that is not how people behave. So this insight that we don't judge the value of an offer or a product in and of itself. We are very much interested in the sense of fairness, very much interested in what other people have been paid. That can definitely I'm 100% be I'm 100% there. Yeah. I'm with those people that decided to vote out of the £8, well, pounds, even though it's better than the £7. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, 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 next yeah. time you're on an e-commerce site, you've put your item in the basket, you've gone all the way through to checkout, 
90% of e-commerce sites transgress this rule. Yeah. They will have a giant box that says, add your discount code. Yeah. What Blount and Basement would say is, if people have bought an item, they're completely happy, or about to buy an item, they were happy with the value. If they think other people are getting mm. a better deal, many yeah. of them will yeah. throw up their hands and walk away. And that's what the discount yeah. box signifies. It other does. people are getting yeah. a better deal. Yeah, yeah, and I haven't got it. it is, in yeah. fact, my, my brother's in the market for a new watch at the moment. And he, I said, oh, have you bought it yet? He said, no. I said, well, why not? He yeah. said, oh, well, the prices went up a few weeks ago. Yeah. Uh, are you happy with the current price? Yeah. yeah. But but they went up. Yeah. So therefore, the, the idea that somebody would have bought the same watch a few weeks ago for less, suddenly he doesn't want to buy the watch anymore. I'm like, yes. that's this, interesting, yeah. right? Yeah, absolutely. You yeah. Know, rationally, it doesn't make sense, yeah. right? If you're happy with the price, the watch, then go for it. But yes. no. But we should, I think that one of the lovely things about behavioural science is this idea, we don't deal with people as you want them to be, yeah. deal with them as they actually are. Yes. And this principle of fairness is a reflection of human nature. So once you know it, you can then take that insight and apply it easily. So going back to our e-commerce example, you know, get rid of the box, put a very uh, subtle little line yeah. that you have to click on to get your box. Do you know what I find the same thing? You know when you get those emails that go 20% off for new subscribers? And I seem to get those emails even as that, I'm already yeah. a subscriber because that, I maybe I logged in with a different email address or I came in on a different URL. It really annoys me because I'm like, well, hang on a minute. I'm a loyal customer. I've been buying five pairs of shoes from this particular site, but I'm not getting the 20% off. A great point. So if that company reads Blount and Basement, what it would show is that mistake will aggravate people who will yeah. lose business. And hopefully it would persuade the powers of B to invest in a better yeah. technique to avoid it. Yeah, you want to be like action. 25% off for returning customers and 20% for yeah. new ones or something like that. Yeah, I either give everyone a discount. Yeah. Uh, and some sites do that. In the discount box, it will say like 1% off, click to redeem this yeah. discount. So you just put up your price by 1% and then give everyone a 1% discount. So no one knows that there are yeah, others having exactly. 10 or 20. Yeah. Some people just show the discount box to people who've come by an affiliate link. Or... You know, maybe it's slightly Machiavellian, but in your example, you would just be very, very careful about making sure that that new subscriber discount is only shown yeah. to new yeah, subscribers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or the existing subscribers have got this secret code that's even better than the new one that sort of only yes. they know. Yes, although then that you know. erodes margin. So you've yeah, got a bit of true. a, bit yeah, of yeah, a yeah. You'd have to put the price up to do that yeah. and all the rest of it. Okay, the next one that stood out. Um, now, we all go, oh, the ads were funnier, weren't they, back yeah. in the day? But Kantar have got some data to show that actually the ads aren't as funny as they used to be. Yes, I think that, that, so they've run a very long study and I think they phrase it slightly um, diplomatically. So it's something along the lines of ads that aims to be funny. Okay, so it doesn't necessarily, yeah. But, um, but, but well, actually, I, I don't disagree with it. I think their data set is about intention and it is something like 1990, mm. over 50% of ads aim to be funny. 2000 and let's say 20, it's down to about 30, 33%. Yeah. So you've seen this long-term decline in the use of humour as a, as a technique. Now, that's problematic from a behavioural science perspective because there are studies that show we tend to remember things better if yeah. we're laughing. Um, we often attribute it to you know, higher status. Yeah. Lots of arguments that show humour is a, is a powerful tool. Yet brands ignore the evidence, and I think there is an increasing reliance on you know, purpose or yeah. trying to argue someone yeah. into, into purchasing yeah, a product. Yeah. So the, 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 again, there's a discrepancy between what the psychological data suggests we should do and what we actually do as professionals. And if you're working as a waiter or a waitress right now, it could increase your tips handsomely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Very nice day. study. So uh, there you go. Yeah, again, by... Make what, a little joke while wait, you serve yeah. the coffee could, uh, could be worth it. Yeah. The, the, the other one, on, on your point about actually being funny, there is, I think it might be a TGI data set where the question is something aligns, I like the ads as much as the programme. Yeah, that's that declined. Has Whoa, declined. That's, well, that's quite dramatic. Now, you could yeah. say, oh, well, the programmes have got better. And I'm sure it's a, probably a mix yeah. of the two. But to me, we, we as an industry get fixated on the wrong issues all the time. Yeah. Um, the AA published data where they claimed that there was a decline in trust in adverts. Yeah. Yet the data set they use is about favorability towards ad sets. Yeah. They have no data at all as an organization that in any way shows trust has declined. But the data they have is that favorability towards ads has declined. So I think concerns about trust are massively overblown. Yeah. What we should be focusing on is this problem of low favorability. Yeah. 
And it, it leads you down to a very different set of solutions, one of which might be to engage and use humour. Now, going back to our friends, Burnett and Field, oh, yeah, yeah, they yeah. have also shown, haven't they, that in terms of large business effects that come from campaigns, the difference between using humour and not using humour is between 1.4 business effects on average and 1.7. So there is actually an effectiveness case for humour as well that I think, you know, we're not, you know, it's not only is humour decline, but actually there's some good evidence to show that it's, it makes business sense. Yeah. So that, I think, would be a, uh, a, a, a you know, a, a finding from them that would be well worth uh, investigating. Now, one, 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 one of the ones I, I, I've long felt this is good. It's reassuring to read in a book something yeah. that you've held as, as a belief for a long time. And you go, okay. damn it. Now there's some evidence for it. But anyway, making something easy Ooh. is like is, is a surefire way to get people to do things. I mean, look, just as a you know, sample of one here, I just find there are so many things in life, you know, that you have to remember your password or, you know, do it in a particular way or whatever. Um, but actually making things easy, the one that made me laugh was the champagne button. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I, I came up with this idea years ago, which is um, I was going to pitch it to Domino's. Actually. Yeah. It's going to be called the panic button. Yeah. And the idea was you get home, you can't decide what to have. You'd have this pre-programmed button on your on your fridge, red, red kind of bright red. Yeah. And it would pre-store your favorite pizza order nice. and it would link, you know, to your nearest Domino's and it would arrive within 20 minutes, you see. And I just think sometimes just... You know, making something easy often overrides, you know, whether I'd go to a different restaurant or whatever, just because it's it's easy. But there's some great examples, aren't there, in the book of how ease can be a competitive advantage. So I always find, if anything, this is probably the, the biggest thing you can do, I would argue, is probably to think about friction in the customer journey. There's some lovely statements from Daniel Kahneman and very similar statements from Richard Thaler, the two behavioural scientists that have won Nobel Prizes. And both of them, when they are put on the spot and asked, look, you've done these hundreds of experiments. If there was one thing that you would recommend people did from all these experiments to improve the probability of behavior change occurring, what would it be? And they both say the same thing. Make it easy. Yeah. However, they also show, or at least there's some other psychologists, but Bergman and Rogers are probably the best example. People kind of get that on one level. You know, people think this is just a statement, the obvious. You remove friction and more of the behavior that you want will occur. People think this is so obvious, they then ignore the finding. The problem is that there is a massive discrepancy between how much of an impact we think removing friction will have and how much it actually has. So there's a lovely Berman and Rogers study that I cover in the book that shows experts recognize that making a behavior, this is like, in, in their example, it's signing up to a new educational program, Experts recognise that removing friction will improve sign-up rates, but they are radically and wildly wrong in terms of the scale of the impact. They think removing friction will have a small impact. It actually has a very, very large impact. And what Bergman and Rogers argue is that these, um, this study is, is a typical behaviour across all experts, that we think the way to change behaviour is to motivate people to want to change. And yes, that will have some impact. But study after study shows often the most effective thing to do is to go through your customer journey, identify even the tiniest, tiniest bits of friction and put more effort into removing those. And if you do, it will totally tend to have an agree. Might, If my own behaviours and things go by, oh, yeah. I'm totally there. You know, yeah. it could be one little thing that stops you that makes you think, oh, I'll come back to this later. Then you're gone. Yes. You, know, you won't come back. Um, people often ignore it because it, it, it feels fun and exciting and it, a good use of our expertise to create wonderful moving ads that's yeah. what we feel you know reflects our our own specialist skills but as marketers it might not feel as exciting but i think the removal of friction is something we do too little of huge absolutely huge let's talk about tipping taxi drivers in new york for a oh, moment yeah, yeah, okay yeah, yeah. so when I, whenever i go to new york on work yes, yes. right um maybe because i'm british i'm thinking oh, i should give the driver 10 percent, and then when it pops up on the machine it says choose between 20 percent, 25 percent, and 30 percent. Yeah. so i end up they're tipping 25%, right? Yeah. That's 15% more yeah. than I had in my head before I got yeah. in the taxi, right? But you show the middle option or the extreme bias rule. There's actually some psychology that shows that how you frame a pricing decision like that can actually significantly increase the, you know, the price you might pay for something yeah. or the option you might choose. So the, the original studies in this idea called extremeness aversion uh, were by Tversky. And in his study... His is a slightly abstract one, but it's been shown in real world purchasing as well. In his study, half of the participants are shown two Minolta cameras. You've essentially got a basic camera for, say, I'll make the numbers up, $200, and a fancier camera, 
kind of like a premium camera for $300. And you get a 50-50 split in purchasing, what people would prefer. Next group of people see those same two cameras. So cheap camera with basic functionality, premium camera with improved functionality. And then there is a third super premium camera for, say, $500. Not many people pick the super premium camera, let's say 20-ish percent. But what's interesting is the relative popularity of the initial two cameras changes. So it's no longer a one-to-one ratio. It now goes from a one-to-three, one-to kind of two-and-a-half ratio in favour of what has become the middle camera, the premium camera. The argument being weighing up whether an item is worth buying, weighing up price versus inherent quality is a phenomenally hard thing. So people replace a complex calculation that gives them the perfect answer with a simpler calculation that gives an almost as good answer. And the simpler calculation is to think, well, pick the middle option. I believe the cheapest one will be low quality and I'll regret it and I'll look a bit mean. The most expensive one people tend to think will be over-engineered and they'll look like a shot. And, and links they gravitate that. towards And links that. There's also this thing like a decoy effect as well. You talk about the book, it's quite clever. It's, uh, sometimes you might have a very cheap option or, or, a, or a less attractive option, which is almost designed to make you, like if you're moving house, you know, someone, the estate agent will show you a really terrible one and then you'll get the one they want you to buy next kind of pop. Yeah, they, 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 it's always hard to explain the decoy option. There's a famous study with The Economist and Dan Ariely where you, you en- essentially introduce a obviously worse example um, to the, the 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 option you want people to buy, an easily comparable and worse. So in his example, half of the people see web only, say $50, yeah. web and print $100. Yeah. And let's say you get a 50-50 split between people because how the, it's very hard to say which is best. Yeah. You're basically getting poor quality and cheap or high quality that's yeah. expensive. You know, how do you determine which is best? It's quite hard. In the decoy effect, he gets another group of people, same two options, and then a third one, which is print only, $100. Now, what you can pick up on immediately and quickly is print only for $100 is definitely worth than print and web for $100. So you're making the obvious comparison with the very expensive item. And it, that steers people yeah. towards it. That's really fascinating. In fact, in, in my work at System One, we've seen just that with our pricing, where we've made the uh, the pro option about three to four times the value of the essential option. Yeah. And the essential option is working as the decoy. It's the one that goes, we can give the basic bit, but the pro one has got probably three to four times the value at twice the price. Yeah. And it's been, 90, it's been 90%, 10% split. Okay. In fact, hardly anybody goes for the essential option. Okay. They're, they're all going pro sort of thing. It's yeah. fascinating. It's, it's well, I, I, I think this whole area of psychology of pricing is, it's, it's a massive sub area of behavioral science. There are thousands of experiments. valuable as well, right? Yeah. You know. So if, if you are... If you are selling products to professionals, mm. Mm. things like Extreme yeah. Reversion, it's a really simple tactic. Don't give someone one price for your service. Give them three and yeah. use that most expensive one, not really to generate direct sales, but its, it's value is yeah. making the other two look, look much good. better. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Great advice. So everyone can apply that. Now, we should, of course, um, you know, true to your book, end on the peak, oh, yeah. end yeah. right now. We have yeah. covered this yeah. a little bit already. But uh, you did a study, didn't you, with Unruly and Effectiva that, that gives some, you know, some data evidence for why the peak end is the bit that people remember as well. Yes. So the initial studies into the peak end rule were done on colonoscopies. Nice. I've always <laughs> been a bit... Not too uncomfortable, of course. No, no. <laughs> you, you, it, it's fascinating insight, which essentially from a colonoscopy, the thing that people remember is the final moment of the operation and the most intense moment. But trying to persuade marketers that they can harness that idea is a bit difficult because Conox is are as, pretty much as far away from marketing as you can get. So we tried to show a bit more closely to advertising that this rule works. And what we did was use uh, the, the database that Effective and Unruly had, which was finding lots of ads that had the same overall score. Uh, so let's say the rating was yeah. 7 out of 10 yeah. for these ads. We then split them into three groups. They had second by second rating. So some of those seven out of 10 ads had um, seven out of 10 all the way through. Others were say like five out of 10 for most of it. And then a a spike for nine and then went back down to five out of 10, but average seven. And then the final ones might've been five out of 10 all the way through, but the last part of the ad was rated nine out of 10. So you've essentially got consistent ads, 
ads with a peak, but not at the end, ads with a peak at the end. And what we saw backed up the peak end rule, that the various different ratings of memorability and recall improved. So consistent ones were the lowest, peak ones were higher, peak end ones were, were highest of all. So the argument being, if you want someone to remember something from an ad or a brand experience, do two things. Don't think of all moments as being equal. Think about how do I create one moment of excellence? Yeah. That will make it memorable. And then secondly, how do you end on a high? Don't fixate as much on great first impressions. That's where everyone turns their attention to. You want to think about what is the thing I can do at the very final moment uh, of the brand experience? That's what will stick in people's uh, minds most. Well, what a brilliant, 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 brilliant way to end, yeah. Richard. Cheers. Thank you so much. It's amazing having you back. And, and congratulations on the success of the book. The first thank one and the second one is out, uh, hopefully, by the time we go live with this. March 28th. March 28th. Yeah. And if people want to employ you to help them apply behavioral science to their Please business, yeah. then they can get hold of you <laughs> yeah. where? Uh, they can email me at richard at astro10.co.uk or DM me on Twitter at our shot or link in and send me a little there note. And, there are many ways. Yeah. yeah. Richard, brilliant. brilliant. Thanks for joining us. Cheers. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening to the Uncensored CMO or watching. If you're seeing this on YouTube, it's great to have you with me. Um, that was Richard Shotton. If you want to get hold of his book, it's out now or March the 28th. That should be when this goes live. If you like that, then do subscribe to my channel on YouTube or where you get your podcasts. I'd love you to follow me. And if you want to get hold of me, I'm over on Twitter at Uncensored CMO. You can find me on LinkedIn as well, where I'm there under John Evans. It's been a real privilege to have you with us. Thank you. And I'll see you next time.